Uh, Phil is a, uh, a good friend, uh, as we learned uh, in talking uh, to him recently. He used to be a street preacher uh, for four years. If you were on the coast of uh, California or walking in the streets in L.A., you may have seen Phil on the streets. Uh, he was also on the streets of D.C., walking and talking, talking about Jesus Christ. Uh, and went from that to being an entomologist, uh, getting on his college degree, and then getting on with the government uh, and the Department of Agriculture, and eventually was one of the founding members of the Department of Homeland Security. And founding members means literally founding members, because as we talked about today, he was within just a day or so, and he was a little too old to enter on the average application, but at age 54, uh, he made the cutoff merely because he was there at the very beginning. And they didn't set that rule into place later. But his wisdom, what he has experienced and what he's done for our country, it would have saved more lives if people had listened to him. But he's here tonight to talk mostly about his experience, and he has a great book that highlights a lot of that. But tonight, he's here to bring, bring you some news. And it's news that you need to pass on to your church and to be aware of because it threatens church leaders and Christians around our country and around our city who may be duped by this. So I am always pleased and so honored to have my dear friend Phil Haney. Please give a big Texas welcome. Phil. Thank you everyone for coming. Do we have to stand? Maybe it'd be easier. You want to stand? I think so. Have them down all stand. <laughs> and I think this mic would be better. Okay. That was breaking up. How many saw or heard the dedication of the embassy I today? I did. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu used the phrase in Hebrew. He used the phrase in Hebrew. He said, Hayom Zeha Yom Gadol. He said it several times. Yom Gadol. Yom Gadol means a great day. Other than today, this has only happened one other time in history, 2,500 years ago. We're seeing something of a biblical significance. If the Bible was still being written as we know it today, this, these events would be in the Bible. And also, he talked about the 1967 war when the soldiers over the radio said, Har Habayat Biyadim. Har Habayat Biyadim. That means the Temple Mount is in our hand. It's a great time. Of course, with the issue of persecuted Christians that we're learning about now, and also simultaneously on the border with Gaza, people being literally pushing themselves against the wall. Who are they really fighting against? God himself and the everlasting covenant. They're fighting against the very forces of eternity, if you will, the forces of gravity. It's a sorrowful thing. And because of this gravitational shift, this change in the, the magnetic fields of the earth that we hear about has happened sometimes, things have shifted. And now the focus has been put on the role of America and its relationship with Israel, and everything's being focused and centered on that, isn't it? And this is setting up the stage for those of us who know biblical or have a prophetic perspective. We're seeing the table set for culminating events. And we are living, friends, in culminating times. And the persecuted Christian uh, challenge is part of it. The recognition of the eternal covenant, the everlasting covenant, and the place of Jerusalem and Israel in, the, uh, in history is also part of it. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is also part of it. They're woven together, or you might say they are gears in the same complicated machine, or they are variables in the same equation. How many, just pop quiz, have ever heard of a thing called the Alliance of Virtue for the Common Good? Mm -hmm. 
Well, by the time we're done tonight, you will know a lot more about it. And the point is, is that somebody can probably tell me what two forms of evil does the Bible talk about? It talks about what I call the ugly kind of evil, the ones, the things in this world that are obviously evil, right? But there's another kind of evil it talks about in the Bible that's not so easy to, net, to uh, identify or discern using a biblical phrase. That is what I call the beautiful evil, the suit and tie evil, the deceptive form, the addictive kind. And what we're going to talk about tonight is not the obvious kind of ugly evil, but it's the, the beautiful, the deceptive the strong delusion that the Bible talks about. The, the title is The Alliance of Virtue for the Common Good. That's where we are. Yesterday I set a record. I drove 947 miles in one day, all the way from Bristol, Tennessee, to Beaumont, Texas, and then came here the rest of the, of the way. I got to participate in the festivities in Houston, meaning traffic, <laughs> <laughs> but I was able to listen to the dedication of the embassy on my earphones while I was driving, so that calmed me down a little bit. I don't have very much tolerance for traffic. There's something about it. The older I get, it's like commercials on television. I am just, I can tolerate them less and less as time goes on. And I, you know, I have to admit, you know, the traffic planners, I thought, were a little smarter in Texas because here next to us is this three or four lane, uh, what is that thing? A tollway with like one car every minute. While everybody else is going winding through the labyrinth of downtown Houston, well, this whole big wide avenue is wide open. So maybe they'll amend that. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do is I put this in chronological order. If, while I'm still thinking about it, I want you to know that I'm going to give Roy the PowerPoint and also a companion outline that talks about each slide, because this is history we're talking about. In law enforcement, we talk about connecting the dots. You've heard that, right? In order to put a picture together, to put a case together, you have to connect the pieces of evidence. You put, connect the dots. Well, in this case, the people that are behind the Alliance of Virtue for the Common Good are doing the job for us. They are connecting the dots. And those dots, remarkably, go all the way back to the very beginning of Islam. In the year, in this case, 622, it's called the Medina Charter. According to Islamic scholars, the Medina Charter, a.k.a. the Medina Constitution, is the first constitution in history of the world. And that it was written or dictated, I, it must have been dictated because according to scholars, Muhammad was not able to write this charter, which is held up as the ideal of human rights. But look, for example, at the very first line, number one, it says they are one community to the exclusion of other people. That's a little bit different than we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So right off the bat, you can see that the, 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 the heart, the foundation of this charter of Medina is, is excluding classes of people. It's not inclusive, which we hear a lot about today, and it doesn't really compare to the themes of the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. So this is where it started, the Charter of Medina. By the time we're done here, all these 
maybe not so familiar names and dates are going to fall into place and you're going to see us a big picture. So the next thing, I just mentioned that already, we're going to fast forward quite a, quite a few years from 622 up until the year 2006, 2007, when this thing called a common word between who? Between us and you. Has anybody heard of the common word? Bill? Yes? Keep your mouth very close to that microphone. you turn it right screen, they put it Okay. Thank you. It's turned up as loud as we can now. Yes, it's not real high. I'll, do, I'll try to focus on that. Keep it close to the The common word is initiated by primarily the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan in the al Bayat Institute and al Bayat has to do with the concept how many have heard of the concept of Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Har they also say al Bayat al-Islam and al Bayat al-Har it's the concept of the Islamic world versus the non-Islamic world. And the common word is an effort by the Muslim world to bring into an alliance a covenant with the Jews and the Christians of the world. Well, the common word doesn't sound necessarily that ominous if you just take it at face value. By the way, I just checked the website a few minutes ago, and it's a still ongoing project, and according to its own website, it's very alive and well, and it says it's the most successful Muslim Christian interfaith outreach in history. Well, that sounds like it's a pretty good thing, doesn't it? Well, let's take a little bit closer look at exactly what is this common word if you were going to sign something, you're either going to do it like Nancy Pelosi said, which is to pass it before we know what's in it, and just sign it blind. I mean, that's like kindergarten level. You don't cross the street until you look both ways. You don't sign something if you don't really even know what's in it. Do you? Or should you? No. So let's find out what's in it. Meanwhile, that will be the next slide. The Yale University initiated a companion response document called the Yale Response to the Common Word. This has come out at the same time as the Common Word was released. There were about 450 Muslim sheikhs, qadis, imams, prominent, primarily Muslim Brotherhood from around the world that signed the Common Word document. And then Yale University School of Theology took it and did an outreach to members of the Christian community in America and asked them to sign <coughs> on to this outreach effort by the Muslim community or the Muslim clerics primarily in Jordan under the auspices of the Muslim Brotherhood. You all know a fair bit about the Muslim Brotherhood, right? al Ikhwan, al muslimun and their global strategy is to implement Sharia law everywhere in the world by a whole spectrum of tactics, all the way from peaceful dawah clear up to the sword of jihad. Whatever tactic is necessary at any given time is authorized, but it's all the same strategy, implementation of Sharia. The, the goal of the global Islamic movement is not jihad or terrorism. It's implementation of Sharia law. And that's a fundamental thing that will help us get a clearer picture of what motivates the global Islamic movement. Are they just terrorists at heart? Do they just like destroying things? No, what they're really trying to do is implement Sharia law. They have a whole list, a whole spectrum of authorized tactics to do it. You see ISIS on one hand, but you see the Muslim Brotherhood on the other. 
The Muslim Brotherhood works through what I call saturation, like water into a sponge, it's floating on a pool of water. Whereas ISIS or the other Salafi pro-jihad groups essentially push on the sponge from above on it to speed up the process of the saturation. It's like Godzilla's foot comes through the ceiling and squishes us, or there's little snakes that slither under the door and bite us in the foot. But either way, yes, they have the same goal. Some of the people that signed this Yale response to the common word are quite well known. In particular is Rick Warren, who is still quite well known, and along with Jim Wallace from Sojourners and several other prominent Christian leaders across the country at the time that this was signed, which is more than 10 years ago. Remember now, what I'm doing is I'm going to walk you through, through a sequence of events leading up till February of 2018, this year, and an event that occurred in Washington, D.C. that was called the Alliance of Virtue. And a document was signed by between three and 400 leaders, they haven't released the names yet, pledging support of this global outreach, interfaith movement called the Alliance of Virtue for the Common Good. So I had asked earlier, well, what is the source of the phrase, a common word between us and you? Well, the source of the phrase is Quran, <coughs> chapter 3, verse 64, which I'm not supposed to turn around, so let me remember. <laughs> oh, people of the scripture, all, a.k.a. people of the book, that's the Christians and the Jews, come to a word that is equitable or common between us and you. So what is that common word? What is the basis of this common relationship? Well, they're going to tell you that we will not worship any but Allah and not associate anything with him and not take one another as lords instead of Allah. But if they turn away, which is the same word as apostasy, then bear witness that we are Muslims. We are those who submit to Allah. Now what does that all, all mean in a context of a biblical worldview? Is Allah the same as the, same as the Lord of the Bible, the creator of the universe, the God of nature and of nature's law? Are they the same? <coughs> Pretty fundamental, isn't it? You know a tree by its fruits. Let's look at it from a Christian perspective. There are three primary fundamental foundational doctrines that the Quran explicitly and emphatically denies. That Jesus was crucified, that he's the son of God, which is what it alludes to here, and that Mahmud, another derivative of the name Muhammad, is the Holy Spirit, AKA the Paraclete, AKA the Comforter, which is what Mahmud means. That's about as close to outright blasphemy as you can possibly get. That Mohammed is the, is the promised paraclete, the one who comes along beside you and never leaves you or forsakes you, the one who <clears throat> brings to mind all that he's ever taught you, that's the press, past, leads and guides you into all truth, that's the present, and shows you things to come, that's the future, that's the nature and quality of the Lord himself, whose name is derived from the verb to be, and or superimposed over that, the concept of existence. The name of God means life itself, and the verb to be, to exist, past, present, future, alpha and omega, beginning and end, first and last, before Abraham was, I am. When Jesus said that, they knew exactly what he was referring to. He was alluding to the name describing the nature of the creator of the universe. Here, this verse, Quran 364, states or denies those essential fundamental Christian theological doctrines. But meanwhile, we don't want to leave out the Old Testament. 
And you will find as we go forward, or you look more into the common word, that they also deny the everlasting covenant founded through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, expressed through the dedication of the temple by King David in Jerusalem when he said that the Lord will keep his covenant for a thousand generations. And of course we know in the real world of Islam, they emphatically and hysterically deny that the Jews have any place in Jerusalem, which is what we're seeing in this very day, the 14th of May, 2018. So now you're beginning to see how these pieces interact and that a very subtle form of evil, beautiful evil, would be to deceive or mislead people of faith, mislead people of faith, into an alliance that flat out denies the very basic foundation of their own worldview and theology. Now that's a pretty subtle form of deception, wouldn't you say? But it actually isn't that subtle, is it? Where is the natural curiosity of the leaders, the Christian community, in the world that we live in today, to simply go and look up the source of what this term, common word, actually means and where it's derived from. That's what I call natural curiosity. And that once they did that and then they put together the realization that it outright denies the basic fundamental theological foundation of both the old cup, the first covenant, the everlasting covenant, and the covenant of salvation which is built on that covenant, that if you sign this document what would that be called in modern times? Kind of like a divorce, <laughs> wouldn't it? A disavowal. So the source of the phrase, a common word between us and you, is an emphatic denial of biblical theology. That ought to be enough right there. Now, this is Bob Roberts. Does anybody know who Bob Roberts is? He's from Dallas. On the left, he is the present real-time Christian face of the Alliance of Virtue for Common Good. And the man to his, all right, is Imam Sheikh Imam Muhammad Majid Ali who is commonly known as Imam Majid, who is the past president of the Islamic Society of North America, a co-conspirator in the Holy Land trial, which took place right in Dallas, Texas. He's also the Imam of the Adams Center in Washington, D.C. But he's also a, a, a contributing specialist to the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. How many have heard of that organization? When I ask you rhetorical questions, it's not really to put you on the spot. It's more to emphasize the point, and I will ask another rhetorical question. Why do you suppose that in the year 2018 that we don't know about groups like the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America? Well, maybe that doesn't sound too ominous. Those are reasonably benign-sounding words, aren't they? But here's what it sounds like in Arabic. Their actual name in Arabic is majama. It's rhymes with pajam. <laughs> Fukah, which is a plural of the word in Arabic for law, which is singular, fiqh, and plural, fukaha, which is lawyers, people who practice law. The third phrase is al-sharia. I don't think I need to translate that one, do I? And the last phrase is bi-amrikia in America. The group of lawyers, sheikhs, qadis, and imams, specialists in sharia, promoting it in the United States. Now, is that constitutional? No. 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 Would you sign a document with a man who is a <coughs> contributing specialist with an organization operating right here in the United States that is promoting the implementation of Sharia law. Would 
you, especially if you were a Christian leader. No. Because that to whom more is given, more is required. If you will go and look, I'll send the link to Roy. I wrote an article published the day after President Trump was inaugurated. It's called The Ominous Roadmap, Roadmap of the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. I walked through a fatwa that they issued on the, eight, on the 18th of November, right after the election, calling the election of President Trump a catastrophe, a calamity. What do we hear about today that's, that's happening in, in the Middle East? Nachbadeh. The day of catastrophe and calamity. Amja posted a fatwa on their website in English calling the election of President Trump a calamity. And then it's a call of action. So what I did is I walked through all 14 paragraphs of the fatwa and I pulled the threads out of it, Quranic threads out of it, and cited 31 different verses from the Quran along with hadith and what is called tafsir and showed how everything that the Amja Fatwa said was a, what do you call that, mirage, using the English language to camouflage actual Quranic theological concepts in a way that would not alarm or alert the average reader because they are not aware or have not uh, studied enough to realize that what they're looking at is a deception. Has anybody remember those? Oftentimes you're in the malls, there are these big pictures, three by five, and they were just sort of like nondescript shapes and colors, and that if you stood just about arm's length away from them and looked, stared at them, but didn't actually stare at them, that you would be able to see right through it, and that on the other side of this amorphous blob of color was a crystalline image of mountains and forests and trees. Has anybody ever been able to do it? Yeah, I could do it too. And that's kind of what this is like, to see through the glass into the other side. And by the way, in the Bible it talks about being able to see through the glass darkly. That phrase, darkly, is not darkly as we think of it objects fading in and out of shadow and in and out of focus and that we get occasional glimpses. What the word is in where we think of darkness is the word enigmata, which is, means mystery, the enigma. What the verse actually referring to is we have the ability through the Holy Spirit to see through the veil of time into eternity. And that's what gives us supernatural power and hope for the joy that's set before us you see into eternity. But we're supposed to be using those skills and abilities to represent the coming kingdom in this world that we live in today. And that is why people who sign documents like this are abrogating their responsibilities and actually denying the Lord. It's not awfully far from blasphemy. Because if you're ashamed of him, what did he say he would be when the day came? I would be ashamed of you. Now we're moving forward a little bit in time. We were just at 2013. Now we move forward to Toronto. Remember what was happening a few years ago? It was called the Toronto Blessing, the outbreak and revival of Toronto. Well, at the same time as that Toronto Blessing was going on, there was something else emerging. And it's talking about the Spirit Conference at the Metro Tor Toronto Conference Center in Toronto in 2008. And what this was focused on was the Alliance of Virtue. They're starting to bring it here to the United States, to North America. And the whole conference was built about around revealing this emerging movement called the Alliance of Virtue. The theme of the 2015 event is the Alliance of Virtue which organizer Sumaya Puna said speaks to a need to form cross-cultural alliances in order to aid and facilitate social justice. And down at the bottom it talks about Linda Sarsour. Is anybody up to date or familiar with Linda Sarsour? 
I wrote an article about her, too, which I'll include in the package of information that I'll, he will send to you. And it's pretty easy to remember. The title is called Thank You, Linda Sarsal. <laughs> because she gave a speech at the ISNA conference last year and declared jihad against President Trump. And then, of course, there was a lot of backlash. She tried to take it back. So what I did is I transcribed the entire speech word by word and triple checked it to make sure it was completely accurate. And then I did exactly the same thing with her as I did with the Amja fatwa. I pulled all the Quranic references right out of it. And these are really helpful resources for you to develop an apologetics, a way of giving an answer to everyone who asks you about the hope that lies within you. By the way, do we have an official timekeeper? Okay, just let me know when we're, uh, you know, we're starting to rip, stretch the rubber band a little too far. And, uh, you know, because I, I could talk for nonstop. All that driving's got me wound up. So here we start to see the step-by-step -step process. Now here we come to another one, and this is called the Marrakesh Declaration. And that is January of 2016. Now we're only a little, about two years out. And notice, notice that it specifically refers to that we affirm hereby that such cooperation must be based on what? I know it's hard to see it there. And again, you'll have the PowerPoint and you can walk back through it and all the links and resources are down in the notes section of the PowerPoint slides. But it's referring to the common word, requiring that such cooperation must be go, go beyond mutual tolerance and respect, providing full protection for the rights and liberties of all religious groups in a civilized manner that eschews coercion, bias, and arrogance. It all sounds pretty nice, except that they say plainly that these values that they're promoting must be based on Islamic values. This is a one-way street. Who is defining these terms, the Islamic community? Are these based on biblical definitions? No, they're based on Quranic definitions and Islamic traditional definitions. Why is this important? Let's pause for a minute and be reminded. What, why is it important to know about this? It goes back to things like persecution of Christians. If the majority of the Christian church can be persuaded that Islam is a religion of peace that respects all religions in civilized manner that eschews coercion, bias, and arrogance, then they immunize themselves from any accountability for the persecution of Christians that's going on around the world. I mean, in particular, the part that they play in it. Because not all persecution comes from the Islamic world, but about 80% of it does. And I'll also tell you the punchline now. In any kind of movement like this, there's always an us and them, right? The common word between us and you. The who, I'm going to tell you who the them is, who is focused as the opposition to this emerging alliance for, of virtue for the common good. Would someone like to guess who that might be? Evangelical Christians. Why in particular evangelicals? Because it's commonly understood across the whole spectrum of the Christian community that the evangelical community people are the most biblically literate and that they are the most committed to standing on biblical principles of all of the range of Christian denominations and communities. You have to go after the ones that are the strongest in order to de-neutralize the whole Christian community. Here's the Alliance of Virtue Peace Route start off in Abu Dhabi. Now we're talking May of 2017. We've gone another year forward. And now look up at the icon in the back of the poster there of this event. And then after that, we look at these people. The person on the left of the circle is Majid, the person that I pointed out before. And then the person next to over is Bob Roberts. 
And then the third person on the right is Sheikh bin Bayed. Now, he is from Saudi Arabia. He's actually the leader of the entire Alliance of Virtue. And he is the one who is infamous for issuing a fatwa authorizing jihadis everywhere in the world to kill American soldiers wherever they find them. This is the person that's leading the Alliance of Virtue for Common Good in affiliation with the, the, one of the highest level Muslim Brotherhood leaders in North America, Majid, Imam of Adam Center, and a pretty well-known leader, Christian leader of the interfaith movement, Bob Roberts from Dallas, Texas. Would you sign a document if you knew even this much about the people that were managing this alliance of virtue, would you? Now we come to the actual event that I referred to you. State Department embraces Islamic cleric who okayed killing Americans in Iraq, call for Israel's destruction. Remember I talked to you about the, the, from a biblical perspective that that they're going to undermine the concepts of the everlasting covenant and the place of the Jewish people in history and their right to have Jerusalem as capital on one side and the basic theological foundations of the New Testament. Here you see an expression of it. And that is, that is uh, Sam Brownback. He is the newly appointed Ambassador at large for religious freedom, and the very first public event that he attended was this Alliance of Virtue event in Washington, D.C. And here he is reading Sheikh bin Bayed. I met with Pat, uh, Ambassador Brownback 10 days ago in the State Department, and I really believe that he's kind of growing into the job. And that he also told me during the meeting that he has four priorities as he sees it in his position as an ambassador at large. He was appointed by President Trump. Because the whole Trump administration is very focused on religious freedom and helping save persecuted Christians around the world. And that's something to be very thankful for, much more so. I would say just as much as President Trump is an ally of Israel, which he's been proving lately, he's also an ally through the administration of the persecuted Christians around the world. So there's a lot of reason for hope. But nonetheless, Ambassador Brownback went to this event and participated in, in his first public appearance. And what do you think the signal that that would send to the global Islamic movement and the Muslim Brotherhood or really the driving gravitational force behind this movement when a high-level official from the U.S. government endorses the whole movement. Is that water in the sponge? That's water in the sponge. Perfect. I use that word saturation because if you use the word infiltration, we hear it, we've heard these, some of these words so much that they're what I call Novocaine words, and your mind just goes numb when you hear it, like racism, or diversity, or inclusion. When things are word used too many times, you become numb to them, and they stop having any meaning at all. So I coined the phrase saturation, so the good guys have the patent on that word. It's out in the vocabulary now, it's called saturation, like water in a sponge. And that's what you're seeing. This is an Al-Qaeda, although he used to be, or ISIS, or Hamas, or Hezbollah. This is saturation from underneath. And this is just his website. Now we're going to walk through a few slides. And notice also, this is February, the same time, 2018, that this event is getting press all over the Arab world. This is from Kuwait. Alliance of Virtue Conference brings faith leaders together in Washington. What I'm doing is walking you through a sequence of events, captured them in real time, right off the, the web, and put them in a sequence that helps you put the pieces together. That this is a very real thing that we're looking at. This is a strong delusion, if you will, like in Thessalonians. 
and that we as people of faith are supposed to have the discernment to tell the difference between good and evil and light and dark and not just to stand passively while it overshadows us but to actually stand and call it out. That again is why they are targeting the evangelicals because of all faith groups in the Christian community the evangelicals are the ones that are most, most biblically literate. I just highlighted the part here that says on his first public appearance at U.S. Ambassador of Art for International Religious Freedom spoke at the event. So this is just a little capture of history. And then this person up here at the top, Sheikh Umar al He's involved with the Zaytuna Institute out in California. He says, Trump's new religious freedom ambassador praises Islamic scholars in first public speech. Notice the signal that he's putting out, like a semaphore flag on a ship. He's signaling the whole world that the American government is praising the Islamic scholars that have initiated this thing called the Alliance of Virtue. Does anybody recall what counting coup is? Yes, it's when you run up and touch your enemy, you don't kill him. And it's showed to be a greater sign of bravery than actually killing your enemy. Remember Dances with Wolves? When the man wins in his hair comes up and says, My name is Wins in his hair. I am not afraid of you. And Kevin Costner standing there with a revolver in his hand and he's so petrified by the spectacular image of this guy on his horse that he's paralyzed. That was counting coup. And that's what they're doing. They're showing us, look what we can do. We can walk right into the center of power of Dar al-Har, the house, the, the house without Islam, and have high-level officials embrace and endorse our efforts. Now here is the actual document, the Alliance of Virtue. It was signed by three to four hundred people. And here's another headline, 400 Muslim Christian Jewish leaders signed the Declaration for Religious Tolerance. And it shows you about Ben Bayat and so on. Now here's some more commentary that's going on while the conference is happening. The evangelicals coming took great courage because of a lot of the attitudes within that community. The guy's name is Zeshan Zafar. Now what is he really saying here? That is the evangelicals who have the bad attitude about this interfaith dialogue global movement called the Alliance of Virtue. Yeah, we're right on time. So what they're doing is narrowing down the focus to this one particular group of people that are standing in opposition to this glorious vision of the Alliance. By the way, who's defining virtue? And who is defining the common good? Are these biblical terms? No. As you will look, find out as you walk through and look at the slide presentation on your own time, that is emphatically stated that these are Islamic values, not biblical, not constitutional either, for that matter. The National Prayer Verses, these are just some more uh, headlines that I took. Evangelicals are making it much worse, Robert said, of the negative views many Americans have of Islam. And pastors are worse than the people in the pews. This is like putting a red dot. This is a one of our own brothers in the faith who is standing in a group before the world and putting a target on the evangelicals, saying they're the worst of all and that their pastors are even worse than they are. Evangelicals join interfaith leaders in Washington to promote religious tolerance and it talks about how surprised they were. I won't be able to read all of this but this woman, Deborah Fikes, who used to be an UN representative, expressed concern that the conservative political party's policies, what conservative party is she talking about? 
in the U.S. are really hurting the most vulnerable, pointing to evangelical support for the Trump administration's recent decision to declare Jerusalem the capital of Israel, despite widespread objection among the Middle Eastern Christians. So here you have the marriage of both of these two concepts that I pointed out to you earlier, <clears throat> undermining Old Testament theology and undermining New Testament theology and substituting, putting in place this new definition of virtue that is initiated by the global Islamic movement and the main force of gravity behind it is the Muslim Brotherhood. I won't try to read through the rest of it. Well, actually I will because part of it, it tells you, remember I told you about connecting the dots? The 400 representatives from the three faiths, this initiative came to fruition on the Arabian Peninsula in the seventh century of the Common Era. The Alliance of Virtue was formed in Mecca in the year 622 and included in its embrace the Prophet Muhammad prior to his mission and leaders from a variety of ethnicities and religions. So what it's doing is bringing it all the way from the year 622 right up to the present time, a one unbroken string. This isn't sort of, kind of, it's not vague and hard to decipher. It's a direct connection from the very beginning of Islam right up until now. And it's saturated itself right into the heart of the community, at least among those who don't have the discernment to tell the difference between their left hand and their right hand. For 200 years, it's not our future, it's not that. The most important thing you can do is call out your own tribe. So what they're doing is undermining the very foundations of our country. And that has to do with sovereignty. The dangerous folly of interfaith dialogue between Christians and Muslims. This is an editorial that's very well written. And here is another one, Alliance of Virtue or Alliance of Vice. These are all post-event um, editorials. And so that's that. And I guess we have time for questions. Is that right? That's right. Well, but before you ask questions, let me ask you just basic ground level. Did you learn anything new today that maybe you didn't know before? Does this seem like something that needs to be known? In this time yes. that we live in, when we're facing things like trying to mobilize a Christian community to help persecuted Christians, or being involved in the elections, for example, or any number of other things that we're going to be dealing with in our, in our lives, both within the faith community and within the political or social arena, or even law enforcement. So it's a very subtle thing. It is like water. And as you spend time and go back through the resources and familiarize yourself with it, and then I'll give you a homework assignment. Try to keep up with it. Every so often, do a query. On your, on your internet and see what news pops up about the ongoing Alliance of Virtue effort. Does everybody know in Google, if you'll put in you know, a search feature, Alliance of Virtue, and just put that, you can do a search feature that will look every day uh, for any kind of article that relates to it. So it's a good way to do exactly what Phil is talking about and then provide that information. We'll, we'll have the slide, like Phil said, in the next presentation. We'll have it downloadable the video available for you also and sit down and share that with your church leadership or, or others and make them aware of that. So it's a great teaching moment. Set up a time, a meeting with your st with the church staff and say, let's just watch this video and look at what they're saying. These are Christian pastors speaking about you and our congregation and others. So it, it's a great way to really take what Phil's provided without you having to worry to explain it. And the best way to respond to this as a believer is to develop an apologetics, meaning a biblically-based response. In exactly the same way that if you're in a political arena, the best way to respond to the challenges that we face is develop an apologetics based on the Constitution. I happen to operate in both arenas. <laughs> So my, my positions are based on Constitution. 
I can literally cite the Constitution and, and make declarative statements, which is a factual statement based on constitutional principles. And because I can do that, I become immovable. People can't slander me and call me a partisan because I tell them I'm a partisan. I'm a constitutional partisan, not a political partisan with an R or a D or an I. But in the faith arena, you do the same thing. You develop apologetics based on the scripture. Any questions? May I have a question? I'd like to ask. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, I notice in these associations that you've described, all of the mediation and reconciliation and protection seems to be for the Muslims. It, it, it's, it's really all one-sided, is it not? They say so. They say that it's all based on Islamic principles and traditions, not, and the Quran, not on anything from the other communities. And so it's not really a, a dialogue, it's a monologue, it's a one-way conversation. Well, why are, why are Christians and Jews signing into that thing? That's a great question. And maybe as you go forward, that might be the area that you focus on, is trying to get that answers to that question. Why are people, I call it, as I said, natural curiosity. Why don't people even have even a minimal amount of natural curiosity to do half the work that I did to go and find out what this really is all about? What is this thing called the Alliance of Virtue? And if they're incapable of it, then you have to start really asking yourself, you know, what's going on up here? What has happened to them that they're incapable of even taking the effort to look into what's really behind this thing called the Alliance of Virtue? Next question. Yes, sir. Actually, it's not a question, but just to thank you for your question. because. Sir, when you mentioned Dar al Harb, mm -hmm. which is actually means the Department of Defense, sir. Yeah. which means the Department of Defense, that means if they sign, that means they know this is the Muslim and they go to a war, right? Like a, like a jihadist. So I don't know why they signed with them. Well, the thing is, friends, I would like to make a, make a mention, and that brothers like him, he's from Iraq. This is a walking treasure. He's a native Arabic speaker. This stuff is not theoretical. I, while I was talking, I was watching him, <laughs> nodding his head up and down, because why? Because what I'm telling you resonates with his life experience. He knows that what I'm telling you is true, because he's seen it up close and personal in Technicolor. And that's why he's here, instead of over in his home country. Because of things like this, and all the various spectrum of kaleidoscope of colors that are all different forms of deception. So I would encourage you, if you have questions about what to do, for, make a friendship with somebody that understands these kind of things in an intuitive way because he grew up in it. And he will increase your ability. He can translate things for you and tell you what words mean and help you develop for apologetics based on a perspective of the world that's a lot more accurate and real than you may have. Am I right? Yes, sir. Okay, next question. question. Next question. I have a question. This uh, uh, Alliance of uh, Virtue, they're the ones that are setting the, uh, the name down, the Muslims. Mm -hmm. They are also uh, deciding what virtue means from their perspective. Who on our side is checking it out and comparing it, you know, to our constitution, to our Christian uh, beliefs and so on like that? Because uh, from what I understand of past readings on the uh, Muslim faith, they're entitled, they're encouraged to lie to the people, to the so-called unbelievers. And uh, so this looked to me like it's very much that same kind of pattern. They pretend to be our friends, but in reality, they're our enemies. Yeah, what you're describing is the subtlety 
they're not actually lying here. They're stating plainly what they're intending to do. Yeah. It's just that nobody in the, among the people of the book are literate enough or fluent enough in, in the languages of the Quran or the theology of Islam to be able to form an apologetics. Maybe that's something that you could look into. Bill, let me borrow your microphone for just a second. I'm going to have Phil answer a couple more questions, but before we do, here. Before we do, I want to introduce you to uh, Karen Moore, or Karen Thomas, excuse me. Karen Thomas, Karen and Tom, um, and if you'll shut off the camera for a second. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I get real frustrated because, I mean, this place ought to be packed out. Uh, myself, and I don't know. I don't know uh, near as much as you do or been through what you have, but why is it? Americans just seem to be asleep, especially Christians, conservatives. You got a answer for I that? I do. Might not be what you might think of an answer, but, or it might be, let me slow down. Yeah, I think so. I think the uh, point when we began to become numb and incapable of responding when we legalize abortion. Because after all, what is more hideous than killing your own children? And if we normalize that, then what else is as bad as that? It's like the difference between a splinter in your finger and smashing your thumb with a hammer. Which one of those two things are you going to notice? And if it's numb to that, you're not even going to notice the splinter. And in this case, the splinter would be the threat of terrorism. We did something to ourselves when we legalized abortion. We made ourselves incapable of responding to the horrible things that we see around us because we legalized and normalized abortion. And at that point, we lost our capacity to be sensitive and aware and respond to the things around us. And those of us probably, I'm sure, there's not a single person here that believes in abortion. And we haven't cauterized or seared our conscience with a hot iron like most of the world has, which makes them incapable of feeling it because there's no ner nerves left there. And I believe, I believe that's where we went, started going sideways. And how, psychologically, it's impossible to respond to something that's less obviously a threat or less obviously hideous than the fact that we kill our own children. And are we worse or better than the Nazis? We sure have cleaned it up, haven't we? It's not a subject for polite inter-party conversation. And yet, the church included didn't take a role, Randall Terry did, yeah. in fighting this. And it was in 73, so how long ago is that? 35 years. 45. 45. I think that's where we started going off the road. We'll take one more question. Uh, we're also going to pass around our version of an offering. So uh, <laughs> it's a box, box lid. Uh, any donations you make will go toward the Truth in Textbook project. We want to uh, give you an opportunity to, if you wish to do that, feel free, but don't feel any pressure to. Uh, Since we only have one more, is there anybody else? Yes. I'm glad to take the question. But... I agree with what you were saying about uh, abortion. I've been, uh, this next month in June, I'll be 40 years a pro-life activist myself since 1978. And I believe that America lost its soul, so to speak, you know, when they embraced abortion. It becomes so natural, so common, that the idea of killing an unborn baby is just normal. Well, it's bad enough to have abortion, but then when you have people that videotape conversations about selling baby parts, yes. and they themselves are the ones that end up getting sued and in trouble for it, as though they're violating someone's yeah. privacy, that 
that tells you how messed up things really are. And it's one of the great things about this church. They support one of the largest uh, family planning uh, services around uh, here in this neighborhood and certainly in the community and have saved, you know, two or 3,000 young babies that would have been uh, aborted if, it, if this church and others who were in this area had not contributed to it. So they also have a Muslim ministry here uh, and do a great job of that. So Pastor Branson is not here tonight. Uh, if you're looking for a church or looking for a home, this is a church that puts its uh, words into deeds. So we're very honored to, to have you. Thanks for your... Yeah. your Thank you. I know Pastor Branson too. I know he's active in many pro-life activities that I am yeah. here in San Antonio. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you everyone. I really do appreciate it. Please thank you.